Jess and Leah, thank you very much indeed for reading for us. May I add my warm welcome to you, especially if this is your first visit amongst us on a Sunday morning. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we shall be looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. So let's pray together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would shine the light of your word into our lives and light them up. In Jesus' name, amen. How should I worship in a way that pleases God? Why do I come to church? If we had more time, I would actually do a kind of... uh, write down the answer on a postcard moment or two and pause for us to write down our answer before we hear what Paul has to say in Romans 12, 3 to 8. That's always slightly unfair, isn't it? But how do I worship in a way that pleases God? And why have we gathered this morning? Paul wants us to worship God pleasingly. And I can think of a few better times for us to be considering these questions than at this time of year when London is coming alive, St. Helens is about to spring into action, we're on the precipice of so much activity as a church family, and indeed many people are choosing the church that they might end up settling in for a number of years in London. Last week we saw the finished work of Christian worship in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Worship that pleases God is led by Jesus Christ through the proclamation of his finished work on the cross. And we saw that all the Old Testament worship words associate with drawing close to God through sacrifices made for sin in the temple, are now tied in the New Testament, following the finished work of Jesus on the cross, to proclaiming that finished work. And so we worship God as we come together on a Sunday morning to declare that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us through speaking about the gospel to one another, singing about the gospel to one another, and reminding one another that God sees us already as perfect, that we are already acceptable in his sight because of the finished work of Jesus. We can go out and worship. Equally, we worship God as we speak about Jesus in the office, on the plane to a business meeting, at the school gate, as we go to serve on Christian camps, as we organize a meeting for others to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Equally, we worship God as we declare what Jesus Christ has done on the cross out there in the world. And then last week we saw the 24-7 logic of genuine Christian work. Given the mercies of God that Jesus Christ has died for us, cleansed us of all our sin, and presented us as holy and acceptable to God, then our worship is a 24-7 affair. We are to present our bodies, as Paul says, in Romans 12, verse 1, as living sacrifices to God. Every part of us, every hour of the week. To say then that I only come to worship God in church indicates a substantial misunderstanding of the gospel that Paul has been declaring through Romans chapters 1 through 12. Or to say that I come to church to worship God only in the sense that I come, uh, uh, or rather, I come to church to worship God only in the sense that I come to church to breathe. I breathe 24 7, I worship God 24 7. And so uh, you can say I come to church to, to worship, but then I worship God outside of church as well, if I understand the gospel. I said last week, we would like to have the sign saying fire exit, the exits rebranded as worship exit we go out to worship. And we saw last week the positive demonstration of genuine Christian worship, that true worship, driven by a proper understanding of the Christian gospel, lived out in the world, proves or demonstrates, actively embodies, the great plan of God, which is to have a people belonging to him, who bring glory to him in all of life. 
Now, I hope uh, if you were with us last week, you were persuaded by the logic of Romans 12, 1 and 2. That this isn't simply the people of St. Helens having a slightly quirky view on worship or the rector of St. Helens going off on one. This is the implication of the gospel that with Christ having died for our sin, presented at us as perfect to the living God, the whole of life now becomes worship. And so if we start to believe wrong things about worship, that for example, my worship is an individual internal experience conjured up as we gather together through right music, light shows, smoke and all the rest of it, a kind of Christian equivalent of a legal high, you demean the Christian gospel. <laughs> if you begin to think, well, Christian worship is just a sort of mystical experience and in a glorious building with wonderful uh, ethereal music, uh, uh, then a Christian equivalent of a kind of Buddhist retreat, you demean the glorious gospel. Now, the finished work of Jesus means that the whole of life now becomes worship, and that is proof of the glorious gospel of God. Now, this week, Paul begins to apply the principles of verses 1 and 2 in various spheres of life. What does worship actually look like? And he's going to go on to talk about how we relate to those who oppose the gospel in verses 14 through 21 of chapter 12. And then in chapter 13, how genuine worship is lived out in relation to state authorities. And then in chapters 14 through 15, in how genuine worship looks when we disagree with Christ other Christians. But here in verses 3 to, th three to 8... Genuine worship in how we relate in love to one another. How to worship in a way that pleases God. And I want us to see three things. First, worship that pleases God begins with an accurate self-assessment. Secondly, that worship that pleases God engages in a proper bodily function. And third, that worship that pleases God results in a right deployment of resources. Accurate self assessment. Verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, in an age where at work we're used all the time to reviews and reporting, to analysis of performance and inspection. This language of self-assessment shouldn't be too difficult for us to get hold of. Paul wants us to assess ourselves rightly. And in an age where self-esteem, self-image, personal status and maintaining my profile are so important, Paul would agree. He wants us to have a right understanding of ourselves. So, says Paul, everyone among you I say to you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Of course, you think too highly of yourself, I think too highly of myself, and I won't engage in proper worship in a way that Paul is anticipating. We have to have proper clarity, however, on what the measure of faith is. Do you see it there at the end of the verse? Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. It could be the amount of faith that God has apportioned to each individual. In that sense, then we, would be, uh, we should be thinking of ourselves according to the different levels of faith and maturity that each has, as if God has doled out different amounts of faith to different people in St. Helens. I think that is a highly, highly unlikely reading of that verse not least because it runs against the very direction of what Paul is urging. If I walk around thinking, well, I've been given a very great deal of faith, then I'm likely to think far too highly of myself. Much more likely that Paul is speaking here about the objective measure of the faith of the truth of the gospel, which Paul has explained to the Romans in the last 12 chapters. One translator has the phrase, each according to the standard of the faith. 
Here then is the plumb line of the Christian gospel. Here is the benchmark of the Christian gospel. Here is the trade standard, if you like, of the Christian gospel, the Greenwich Mean Time of the Christian gospel. Everything is to be measured by it, not least the way I consider myself this morning on the 10th of September 2017. Uh, Simpo once told me that art students spend their life talking about themselves and he, he gave us uh, an indication of an art student as they try to talk uh, about somebody else. That's enough time talking about me. Let's talk about you. Tell me, what do you think about me? Well, let's talk about ourselves then, shall we, for a moment. What does the gospel, as outlined by the Apostle Paul, tell me about me? <laughs> We've been thinking about it all morning. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not even that one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together we've become worthless. Our throat is an open grave, says the Apostle Paul. Here then is the plumb line. When I look horizontally at you or some other individual in my street or the person who works with me in the office or the hospital, I might persuade myself that my 0.9 percent in terms of decency and uprightness, is really rather favorable alongside that person's 0.1%. But when I look at God and I see his 100% perfection, then I begin to consider myself as I truly am. I have suppressed the knowledge of God. I don't give him the honor he is due. I have engaged in gossip and envy and malicious conversation and greed and so forth and so on and pride. And no amount of remarking, no number of appeals to the examination board or the admissions tutor, no sp series of special pleadings or victim claiming is going to change the way God sees me. There is no one righteous, not even one. And yet God has found a way in which in his righteousness he can declare that I, the unrighteous one, can now be treated and viewed as blameless, holy. In his son Jesus Christ, God's wrath has been propitiated. That is, it's been satisfied. It's been paid for through the death of Jesus on the cross. In his son Jesus Christ, I have been redeemed. I've been brought back from this position of being under his judgment. In his son Jesus Christ, I now stand justified in his sight. He looks on me as perfect as I shelter under the finished work of Jesus. In his son Jesus Christ, I have been reconciled. I'm now in relationship with him. I've been brought from life to death, from wrath to reconciliation, from a position of serving and being enslaved to sin and death to a position of service, of grace and life. And in his son Jesus, God himself has come to dwell in me. So that in every single believing person here on Sunday morning, God himself dwells by his Holy Spirit. So now as we think about ourselves with sober judgment, and as we consider our status according to the standard of the faith, as outlined by the Apostle Paul, we find ourselves as beggars with our bowls out on London Bridge who have suddenly been brought into the inner sanctum of Buckingham Palace. And we find ourselves as bankrupts with the repossession bailiffs hammering on the door who suddenly find our bank accounts are, have been credited with a billion dollars. And we find ourselves as refugees adrift in the Mediterranean with no place to hide in the storm who suddenly find themselves plucked and put on board the mercy ship. How then could a person who belongs to Jesus think too highly of themselves? I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned. How could a person who belongs to Jesus puff out their chest and strut their stuff in the local church as if they in some way are superior to the others? And how could a person who belongs to Jesus hold themselves above any other person who belongs to Jesus on the basis of social status or educational achievement or financial 
accumulation or family connection. Who cares if we've got letters of rank and achievement before or after our name? Who cares if people stand up when we enter the room at work or whether there are five zeros after the sum they pay us for our annual salary? We are to think of ourselves with sober judgment. Have you noticed how in our culture we have such a great desire to reinvent ourselves, to promote our own image, to boost our self-esteem and to advertise our own brand? If you haven't noticed that, then I suspect you haven't been anywhere near the internet or any sort of uh, um, uh, social media. We post our achievements, we update our status, we polish our profile. Paul says, each of us that think of ourselves with sober judgment according to the standard of the faith. When we think about it, it's beautiful, really. There's no need to hide. There's no need for dishonesty. There's no need for falsehood. But at the same time, as I acknowledge that I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that my life is pockmarked with acts and attitudes of rejection against God, at the same time, I realize I am more loved than I could ever imagine. Here, then, is where true worship begins, with an accurate self-assessment, because only with an accurate self-assessment Are we enabled then to devote ourselves to one another that genuinely, in a way that genuinely recognizes what God has achieved? And so we move to our second point. An accurate self-assessment enables a proper bodily function. And here we look at verses 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, I wonder if you can see the link between verse 3 and verses 4 and 5. The letter arrived first in Rome to be read out to a whole group of different small gatherings or congregations. We've already seen in chapters 9 to 11 of Romans that the Roman church was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. So easy for the Jews to puff themselves up. We've had dealings with God for centuries. We have a whole history of living to please God. And so easy for new Christians from a Gentile background to puff themselves up and think more highly of themselves than they ought. New kids on the block with all the zeal of the new convert, discovering wonderful new things about God. Uh, If I am puffed up or proud as a peacock or if the small group I'm involved in or the people I meet with in my area of St. Helens considers itself somehow superior or inflated to others, then we will never engage in the kind of worship that God wants us to engage in, in the body of believers, his church. Imagine a group if it felt it was somehow superior in one way or another part of the St. Helens group, but somehow, well, we're rather better because we're in the Bible overview or uh, read, mark, learn Romans. Picture three or four members of a Women on Wednesday group if they felt for one reason or another, social, financial, educational, that they were somehow superior to the others in their group. Never engage in the body of believers international growth groups, because we come from Asia, then somehow we're above everybody else. And the image that Paul uses here is quite brilliant, isn't it? The body. For, as in one body, we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Now, these two verses are perfectly crafted, Consider your body for just a moment, your thumb, and just hold it out and have a good look at it. I hope it's still there. And imagine if your thumb were to think to itself that it was more important than every other part of the body and therefore able to subsist on its own with its own agenda set apart from the rest of the body parts which were less significant than the thumb. I don't know quite how a thumb puts its hands on its hips, 
and flounces off the stage, or I'm not quite sure how a thumb purses its lips or starts to deal high-handedly with other parts of the body, or how a conversation between William Taylor's thumb and William Taylor's, uh, the rest of William Taylor's body actually works. But picture your thumb for a moment. You know, I'm not sure I need you. I'm rather more important than you. I don't know if you can see my thumb there. And I'm going to strike out in unilateral independence because really I'm above all the rest of you. It's an absurd idea. And so says Paul, in Christ, as we think of ourselves with sober judgment, we've all been brought back from a position of being bankrupt and under God's wrath to a position of being reconciled. We've all been redeemed into one body. We have all now been declared to be right with God. And in Christ, he has now come to dwell in every single one of us, and therefore we are all now part of this one body united together for the work of true worship, which is the proclamation of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ out there in the world as we live lives that please him. Notice the way the image works so beautifully. We don't all have the same function. As in one body, we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function. This preserves individual gifting. There's a whole range of different roles and responsibilities in the body. We are one body with Christ. Notice Paul does not say, become one body. He says, you are one body. So the moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you become, whether you like it or not, part of the body. We individually belong, so that it's not some sort of cult-like uniformity, we are each, with his or her own personality, individually members of the body. And yet, we belong. We, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. You no longer belong to yourself. Can you see then how in our individualistic culture the Christian gospel has radically changed the way we think about ourselves in connection to one another? And how it is in the gospel and the gospel alone, which is why Paul is so unashamed of the gospel and wants to proclaim it across the world, that this body is created. So that true worship, genuine pleasing God, is not a matter of me coming into church each week for one or two hours to get my Christian equivalent of a legal high or a Buddhist mystical experience and then heading off for the rest of the week to live out my life how I want. True worship that genuinely pleases God is a matter of me applying the gospel to the way I think of myself in relation to you. I belong to you. We belong to each other. I am no longer my own. I belong to Christ. And isn't the image of the body a striking one? There are all sorts of things that Paul could have used. This doesn't quite make sense, but, you know, Paul doesn't use the image of a bus. I know they didn't and all the rest of it, but, you know, in the first century there weren't many buses about. But he doesn't use the image of a bus with, you know, Charlie Screen and Henry Etoc Taylor heading up the 230 Mandarin congregation, Gwilym Davis, the international growth groups, them at the steering wheel and all the rest of it, and uh, them doing the driving and everybody else dozing dozing off in the back. That's not the image. Nor does he use the image of a sports team with everybody on the pitch doing the hard work and then the coach turning up and occasionally wagging a finger and complaining about the referee. Nor indeed does he use the image of an orchestra with all of us living our separate lives just coming together occasionally through the week to do something and produce something beautiful and then heading off to live our separate lives. A body. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. It really challenges our individualistic 21st century London view of ourselves. 
Have you noticed in our culture how though we are more enamored than ever with defining ourselves and our own individual identity, nonetheless we crave intimacy and security of belonging to others. So even as I craft my profile and my status, I'm longing to have my group of contacts. And much of the anxiety generated for our teenage kids has to do with not being part of the group. So even as our obsession with individualism leads to isolation, so our longing for community generates anxiety. The Christian gospel, it allows us to be honest about ourselves. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Christian gospel, it gives us the highest possible self-esteem. He has poured out his love into our hearts by his spirit whom he's given us. The Christian gospel guards my individual personality. I am a precious individual, beautifully crafted, each one individually. The Christian gospel brings us into intimate community, each one individually members one of another. It's glorious, isn't it? You're not going to find it out there in the world. This does mean, though, that our worship, if it is to be worship that pleases God, will result in me asking, well, how am I then fulfilling what God has made me? Remember, it is a reality. You and I are part of the body. That's not something we're open to choose. We are part of the body. Remember that each one of us has a part to play. We don't all have the same function. If the thumb went on strike, you'd know all about it. Remember that though an individual, you actually no longer belong to yourself, you and your family. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Or do we think too highly of ourselves? Do you see? Hey, you don't realize who my family is. You have no idea what responsibilities I have at work. Haven't you seen my list of achievements? Can't you understand what I'm going through? I can't possibly belong in this kind of way. Or maybe you think too highly of yourself. Too special, more important, more deserving, too high flown. So true worship that pleases God has an accurate self-assessment and true worship that genuinely pleases God engages in a proper bodily function. Let me tell you, I've been studying this all week. You feel challenged. Imagine how I've been feeling all week. And I've been reminding myself that if God happens to have been given a gift of being able to teach the, the Bible, it's not mine for me to decide how I use it. It is to be put to work for the sake of the body. I'm an individual but I don't belong to myself. I belong to Jesus, and I belong to you. So true worship, then, that genuinely pleases God results in a right deployment of resources. And I want to suggest that this is why we gather together midweek, why we gather to here on a Sunday morning. This is actually why we come to church alongside proclaiming the truth of the gospel. We come to gather to exercise the gifts that God has given us for the sake of the body, but it is not simply confined to one and a half hours on a Sunday morning. This is a whole week-long affair. And so you can see in verses 6 through 8 that there are seven gifts listed. It's one of a number of gift lists in the New Testament. It's by no means exhaustive. Paul's point is that we are rightly to deploy the particular gift that we have been entrusted with for the sake of the body. That is, if you understand the gospel, then you will be asking the question, okay, well, in what way has God gifted me to the St. Helens Church family, the small group that I'm part of, the group of Christians where I belong? How has God gifted me for that group now I'm going to get on with it. That's if I understand the gospel, and that's part of my worship. So here's the list. I'm not going to spend long defining each one. We could spend a whole session on each. Having gifts 
that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to, I think it better is in proportion to the faith. If service in serving, the one who teaches in teaching, the one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let us use them. Prophecy is speaking and specifically applying God's word. It doesn't include the public weighing of that teaching because women are allowed to prophesy publicly in 1 Corinthians 11. But in order to model a proper place of different genders, gender roles, women are not allowed to pronounce finally and publicly on particular application of God's word in 1 Corinthians 14. So prophecy is speaking and specifically applying God's word, declaring the truth of God. And you can see that the one who prophesies is to do so in proportion to his faith. And that phrase could equally be translated according to the standard of the faith. So that the speaking and application is to be in line with what Paul has explained in chapters 1 to 12. Service is the activity that enables the public teaching of the Word of God. Any number of things that go on to make sure that God's gospel is declared. That's service. Teaching is instruction in the doctrine of the Christian faith. Exhortation is encouragement and urging on in application of the Christian faith. Contribution is generous giving to support the work of public proclamation and the needs of the saints. And leading is leadership in the advance of the gospel. And acts of mercy are deeds done for fellow brothers and sisters in need in the body of the church. Now these gifts will be exercised to one degree or another as we gather. Why do we come to church? Oh, to declare the truth of the gospel, to speak of the finished work of Jesus Christ, and to exercise gifts which strengthen one another in that truth of the gospel. That's why we come to church on a Sunday. That's why we gather. Please note that everybody is involved. Look at verse 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. This isn't just the rector or a small group of uh, group leaders, really keen ones, or a couple of missionaries here and there. This is every single one of us. Please note that we're to do it with energy and commitment. Let us use them with zeal. Please note that the different parts are to work together so that God has given all these gifts to the group uh, uh, that meet uh, in St. Helens and as St. Helens so that we can exercise the gifts to one another. And please note that as we do this, so we will declare the glorious truth of the gospel. So as we close, you see, there is to be no Clint Eastwood Christianity. When I was uh, growing up in my teens, Clint Eastwood was my hero. I'm sorry to say that, it just shows what a complete prat I was, but there we go. Clint Eastwood was my hero, you know, riding off into the sunset, a lone figure, striking out in isolation. The gospel will not allow that. And however disparate we are in terms of geography and location through the week, the gospel has brought us into the body of the church. There's to be no Clint Eastwood Christianity riding off into the sunset. You actually belong to the body of the church. And therefore, there's to be no kind of backseat Christianity. And you think, man, to say, if the thumb suddenly, you know what it's like when you get a, the, something goes wrong with a little toe or some a part of your body that you haven't even known about previously, and then suddenly something goes wrong with it, and you suddenly, oh my goodness, I didn't realize it was so important. And so there's no sort of, well, I'm so frenetically busy that I really can't get involved in serving the body how the body will suffer. You haven't understood the gospel and you don't know anything about worship if that's the way we're thinking. And so there's no sort of early retirement Christianity. I know sometimes as we've been exercising, whether it's a teaching or something like that, people in our small groups feel, wow, we've really got a bit exhausted. We need a year out. But if Sunday morning were to be full of people with gifts in teaching the word of God who are having two years out, three years out, four years out, because, oh, I'm too busy at work, or my family's exactly whatever it happens to be. I think we'd be beginning to say, isn't it not time you changed your job? 
or rethought your family dynamic, or reorganized your social life so that you can be part of the body? Or do you think too highly of yourself, you see? And so we begin to see what is true worship that pleases God. True worship that pleases God. This is only, um, by the way, key stage one. We've got another four or five to come, which we're going to pick up again in October, late October. But key stage one of true worship that pleases God is right thinking, is uh, active engagement in the body, and is right exercise as we put to work the gifts that God has given us. And so you might say to somebody over coffee, we're going to have coffee now, you might say to somebody, why do you come to church? And you might say to somebody, um, what gift have you been given? Have you thought about it? And if you're not sure what gift you've been given by the Lord to serve the body, you, you might actually say, what, what gift do you think I have been given? Quite often other people are much better at working these things out than we are ourselves. And then when somebody says, well, I think you've been given this gift, you're a tremendous encourager. You're a great exhorter. And, you know, you're a, you, people all over St. Helens are thankful for your generosity. You're a great, merciful, kind person who people have been around. Then, well, get on and use it. I don't think too highly of yourself. Remember you're part of the body. Deploy the resources rightly. Let's pray together. Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. We praise you, living Lord, that you have made us holy in your sight and acceptable to you through the finished work of Jesus. We praise you for the possibility now to live for you as a walking, talking sacrifice in gratitude for all you've done. We praise you that this so demonstrates the beauty of your work in the Christian gospel, that you've enabled it. Please help each one of us to think rightly of ourselves. We pray that you would help each one of us to take our part individually in the body belonging to one another. And we ask that as we do so, the result would be your gospel being proclaimed and people bowing the knee in lifetime of worship. For your namesake. Amen.